This is not an opinion, it's a statement of fact. 12% of the prison population is black, and only 3% of the whole population is black. I'm passionate about changing the stats, so I'm gonna make an impact. But when you fight to take control, and try to break the mold, despite an aching soul, over time it takes a toll. I'm not okay. Stop claiming you're stressed, and ignore that little pain in your chest. The odds are stacked against us, and it's time it stopped. There's definitely been a long history of specifically criminal justice policy, but also other types of policy impacting disproportionately on communities of colour in particular. Historically in this country, black communities have been the ones to bear the brunt when the government decides that it needs to be tough on crime. And that isn't because black people are more prone to criminality. It's because of the racial bias. It's because of the policies that are discriminatory. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! The murder of Stephen Lawrence in 1993 sparked national outrage. The subsequent report, published in 1999 by Sir William McPherson, made over 70 recommendations and concluded that the Met Police was institutionally racist in its investigation of the murder. The inquiry recommended that the existing race discrimination law be amended, rather than the government only being liable after unlawful acts of discrimination it should have a legal duty to proactively consider race equality when developing its policies. This ultimately led to the public sector equality duty. So the public sector equality duty is a duty on public bodies to consider how their policies or decisions affect people who are protected under the Equality Act. So the Equality Act has nine protected characteristics and these are things like race, gender, religion, etc. And then the public sector equality duty says that public bodies and government departments must have due regard to three equality objectives. So to eliminate discrimination, advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations between those who have protected characteristics and those who don't. Well, all of a sudden, all of these issues were high priority. It wasn't just an appendage. It was the golden three going through all of the, the policies and practices. But despite the government's equality duties, in recent years they have repeatedly introduced more and more policies which their own statistics, their own data and their own equality impact assessments show have a disproportionate and discriminatory impact on racially minoritised communities. Despite the public sector equality duty, these discriminatory policies are often justified, even though their impact has not been effectively mitigated against. Many civil society organisations are asking, is the government doing enough to meet its legal duty? The government has a lot to do and we can see it's not been doing half as much as it should be doing if we want to eradicate racism and ensure that we have a socially equitable society. You can't legislate yourself out of racism. It doesn't operate like that. It, it runs so deep and it's so kind of systemic. Thinking about just having equality duties feels like a very blunt instrument to actually tackle something that's so embedded in this country. We see time and time again that the government, they're aware of the dispor disproportionality and will try and justify it. When there is an equality impact assessment to read, it's a really superficial and perfunctory analysis. And even in cases where they themselves acknowledge that racial injustice might be pervasive throughout the policy or might come about as a result of the implementation of the policy, we just see the government making really facile statements that effectively amount to a cop-out. It is also fundamentally terrible policymaking because it undermines an essential safeguard and method of holding them to account. Serious violence reduction orders, which can be given to someone who has a previous conviction, effectively creates an individualized, suspicionless stop and search power, such that the police can stop and search someone without suspicion, effectively whenever they want, if someone has an SBRO. By the Home Office's own kind of equality impact assessment, not only in terms of who will be given an SVRO, but also in terms of who is stopped and searched under an SVRO. This will have a disproportionate impact on black men. And yet we see the government pursuing time and time again policies that lack an evidential foundation, that are untransparent and unaccountable. I 
think the place to start with the impact of stop and search is on the harms of the practice. And I think that's something that sometimes we forget or because we're so used to hearing about stop and search, we don't listen to the people who are subject to them telling us how harmful it is. So stop and search is a really physically, mentally and emotionally traumatizing experience. Young people detail their experiences of being humiliated, embarrassed. It strips people of their dignity and causes immense harm. The Independent Office for Police Conduct did a deep dive into some case studies of stop and search. And some of the case studies were horrific. One that comes to mind was a young black boy being punched and, and beaten by police. They're the ones that make the headlines, but they happen every single day on our streets, in police vans, police stations, in our schools. I have quite a few engagements that are negative with police, ranging from them not believing that I have the occupation that I have because of my appearance, to them actually breaking my hand because of an encounter where they thought I was somebody who I wasn't. The force that was still used um, against me, even though I was at a point of surrender, I have arms out and stuff, was beyond aggressive, beyond unreasonable. Police in our communities often categorise young black boys as it seems like animalistic. It's over aggressive, which I witness on a day daily basis. But my personal experience, daily basis, stopped and searched by police inside of our pockets, down to socks. We didn't know our rights. We were like 15 years old, literally coming out of school, going to the chip shop. And that was normal for us. We'd record it, laugh at it. But as you get older, you start to see, right, like, because of these engagements, I've naturally grown to not like police. Like, I don't want to associate with you because of what you've done time and time again. Little Leroy being stopped on the sus floor in the school gates after band practice. I remember it vividly as if it happened yesterday. That's over 50 years ago. And I remember how I was being stopped but my white band member mates just walked through. In regards to the gang's matrix, it's a police database intelligence tool, operating tool that was designed to identify people involved in violent crime, gang, gang crime. It's been in operation for about 10 years now. If we think about what it was designed to do, which was lower violent crime, we've seen in London, violent crime doesn't seem to, to, to have been lowered by this. But what it has done is specifically target young black males as being part of criminality, even though some of them were not and adopt a different policing approach for those people. Violent crime is a serious issue for society and it must be addressed. However, how the police over the last 10 years have decided in London to do that has meant that black males have been racially discriminated against. As someone who, who comes from Muslim background, someone who's been stopped under terrorism powers, it's really concerning that we're, we're using the same kind of framing around violence that we've looked at in terms of terrorism, anti-terrorism. There has been problematic counter-terrorism measures such as suspicionless stop and search powers, which the European Court of Human Rights has declared as unjust because it leads to disproportionate and discriminatory targeting of Muslims and other racially minoritized groups. We know that strip and search is used more widely and we know that there is a disproportionate use against black children. And I think we were all horrified when the case around Child Q was revealed. A young black schoolgirl who was strip searched at school by police whilst on her period. Each time the government introduces another discriminatory criminal justice policy, black, Asian and minoritised people are disadvantaged. The repeat discrimination they face accumulates. These multiple policies layer up and the cumulative impact of them is not currently acknowledged or monitored by the government, so it's also not effectively mitigated and remedied. The government tell us these individual policies are justified for the greater good, but taken all together, there comes a point where the balance is tipped and the cumulative discriminatory impact is no longer justified. The government needs to assess the policy and legislative changes, not just on an individual basis in a silo, but cumulatively, all policies across their whole department as to whether there is any direct or indirect discrimination regarding race. The odds are stacked against us and it's time it's stopped.